right. So for those who don't know, we record this um, for and we post it on the Institute YouTube channel. All right. So welcome. Uh, it's always a delight to to see you. Uh, as I was just saying to Claudette, you know, we, we travel the world with this call. And um, everyone, you know, please do post your location in your Zoom name. Uh, and it's just a joy because it's the only touch point we have face to face with everyone. So we really appreciate you doing this. And this month is a slightly different um, monthly meeting because you get me. Uh, I've just had the pleasure of launching a new book. And I'm going to share with you uh, some of the content from the book um, that some of you will be familiar with. Hey, Shona. Uh, some of you will be with familiar and some of you um, might just be a little bit of new. All right. Uh, so our agenda today, uh, as usual, Antonio and I, uh, we alternate each month and um, we always start with updates. And then we go into the topic. For those who are not so familiar, sometimes we have guest speakers, sometimes we have uh, members sharing a key challenge, uh, other times we have debates. It just we mix it up each month. And um, many of you uh, know um, that we launched to the members in August 2.0, and the monthly meeting talked about the changes officially now up on Amazon and released um, as the from SII. We're delighted um, that after seven, eight months of amendments and changes, the playbook is now available to the public. We don't target to sell this as a B2C book. It's a B2B. It's a hundred US dollars. It's very much, you know, it's very context rich and content rich. So, it's at a higher price. So we're not looking at mass volume. We're looking at people who really value implementation. And, you know, Anita, we were chatting. She she loves the, the hard copy. Some people still do. So, you know, it's to give you that option. And if you didn't receive the electronic copy, then just send me an email. You should all have received it in August. So if you've not got, and if whatever level of membership you have, Antonio and I decided to give every member a complimentary copy of the ebook. So if you haven't received that, then please do let me know and we'll make sure you get that immediately. A little something a little bit new that came from the members feedback. Uh, there was a suggestion to be able to add a digital badge to social media. So we did. Uh, here we go. This is the Strategy Implementation Institute digital badge. Um, up to you whether you decide to add it, uh, for example, to your LinkedIn profile, which I'll show you how to do in a moment. But some people like to use it. Um, we know a lot of people take the course because it's a job enhancing opportunity. That's the number one reason that people take the course. So then having that acknowledged that you are a member reinforces it. It reveals your passion for continuous learning. And also it motivates further development. So you become part of that network and people recognize the badge um, is either being, yeah, it should go out. It's either just gone out or it's going to be sent to you in email. And there'll be instructions. Uh, you can take a picture of this slide, but the instructions will come in the email. And I've just put in the guidelines um, on how to upload it, for example, on LinkedIn, which is very straightforward. I did it in just a couple of minutes. Robin, am I being stupid, but I'm not seeing a slide? That might be because I haven't hit share. Okay, that would be lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Shona. Okay. I thought I'd put oh, my hand up. Yeah, this was my last. I've been doing great. I've been on Zoom calls all afternoon after teaching a group of Russians this morning. I was doing great, Shona, until that point. <laughs> uh, um. 
where am I, where are we going? Here we go. It might help if I hit the share button, might it? <laughs> All right. So welcome everyone. We'll start again. All right, start again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there's the membership badge. Everyone go, yay! Yay! <laughs> okay, and this is the instructions that I was mentioning. Very easy to do. Okay. One second, please. Yeah, yeah. I'll just hold it for a sec. Hey, Chris. Thanks. Hey, Anton. Hey. Hi, Robin. How are you? Oh, good. Uh, your book is amazing. Ah, I'll pay you later. Thank you. <laughs> 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 so there we go. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, honestly, to give you to give you some 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 credit for this one, Robin, it is a extremely fun book to read. Uh, I like the fact that it's extremely descriptive. So I, I transform a lot of the things that you have written down, actually also into PowerPoints and into methodology that I'm actually applying to uh, to a project that I'm working on right now. Oh, so nice. it's 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 very hands on, and I really really like it. And also I can explain using your book when I prepare for a session or for a workshop. Uh, perfectly, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is the direction where we're going. This is expected from you. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an extremely, extremely good book. I really, really like it. Thank you so much for making it. Well, thank you for those lovely words. I think we'll just stop there, everyone. That was great. I think we'll just end <laughs> on that note. <laughs> I, th I think if I do a little bit more, you're just going to rise off the air. You're going to just shoot off like a record rocket. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, the, the words are, you know, Antonio, you know, you spend a year, two years writing a book and you're sitting at your desk and, you know, so to have that kind of feedback is so rich. So thank you for your kind uh, words. You're welcome. Uh, for those who I'm not so familiar with, Anita, we've only got to know each other recently. Um, this is actually my ninth book on strategy implementation, which is about nine times more than about anyone else who's written. So I just, and I was amazed because it came out at 400 pages or just under 400 pages. And I didn't realize I had that much to say until I saw the printed copy because I never looked at the number of words. It never occurred to me. I just was writing with passion. Um, so it's been a work of pleasure. Um, Filmon, you'll know DBS, uh, Piyush, uh, the CEO. I work with him closely. He was kind enough um, to support, and he wrote the foreword for the book, and we did a book launch a few weeks ago in Singapore. Um, so today's meeting um, is to share with you the, the, the messages in the book, um, and I'll share how they complement the work we do in the Institute as well. And I'm just... Need a moment. Okay. Um, so here we go. So most of you know this, but uh, it's amazing that I still have to share it with an audience of leaders, which I do you know, two, three times a week, that to this day, more implementations still fail than succeed. And most of you know that now that this is our challenge. This is some recent research, uh, and it's not even in 2.0 because it came out just after we'd gone to print. Bain and then McKinsey uh, two months ago came out with the same research. Unsurprisingly, more than a third of large companies have a transformation underway. No shock there. But look at this. Both Bain and McKinsey agree that only one in eight, 12 percent of major changes programs produce lasting results. Now, <laughs> depending on what side of the fence you're sitting, that's either good news or bad news. So for those- It's good news, it's business. <laughs> yeah, but for people like Shona, who's managing projects for the British government, it's bad news, okay? Small details. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, and Claudette, the work that you're doing with the wonderful transformation you're doing in the Caribbean, you know, this is our challenge. 
you know, that it's, yes, we get the hype, we get the excitement for a year or two, but not only does it dissipate, also the impact rapidly dissipates. Now, looking at who's on the call today, this quiz should be very easy. So this is a quiz uh, that I run, and I just thought it'd be a fun way to kick off uh, this evening, or sorry, today's meeting. So here we go. Uh, it's A, B, or C, okay? And um, you can either shout out, or you can, I'll open the chat box, and you can um, just post in the chat, whichever you prefer. So what percentage of strategy implementations fail? C. C, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's an easy one just to get us into the rhythm. A lot of these you'll and, more, and more in the public more in the public sector. Do you know we talked about this Shona earlier in the year and we were looking at doing the research? I wonder if there's any compare I wonder if there's any do you know any references that states that? I've got I've got the reference to my fellowship paper. I'll I'll dig it out. Yeah. Okay, I've got it as well, so I can have a look. Thanks. Yeah, okay. yeah, it was it was yeah. 80%. Yeah, no, but it's, um, it's not it's not only in the government sector uh, it's it's i can see that uh, in in where the space where i am at the moment exactly the same numbers is it okay yeah 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 oh, sorry yeah it's, due uh, to ndas i can't scream it out but yeah it's uh, yeah. yeah number wise it's the same so you know for for those of us consulting to the field good news <laughs> okay. yep number 2 how much of the strategy planning is it ideal to have in place before you start implementing? I don't know if I put this in the exam. I use nope. this in other exams. So is it 50, 80, or 100%? Eighty. OK, so I got B and B coming through. Uh, yeah, everyone's going B. Well done. So. One of the misunderstandings of leaders is they strive to have a perfect strategy, which is actually an oxymoron. Because it's the day, the second you walk out of the boardroom, things around you are changing. Unfortunately, the geopolitical situation, inflation, commodity prices, internally, uh, employee turnover, leaders, customer required. So you can never have a perfect strategy. Our goal is you build the core principles, you agree on how you differentiate, and then you get going. Excuse me. Okay. Anton, you want to add? No. No? Okay, sorry, I thought you were going to say. Uh, number three, what percentage of people can articulate their organization strategy? Five, 35, or 55? Yes, thank you. I got worried if you got that one wrong, because this is definitely in the course. <laughs> it is the 5%. And it remains at that, despite people knowing this is an issue. So we still have to shout about it. How can employees change the way they work if they don't know why or what they're changing to? Number four, oh, I think about seven or eight I put in. What percentage of people know the right actions to take the implement? So only 5% know, but even those who know, what percentage know what to do? 12, 32, or 42? Yeah, okay. Well done, yes. So of those who even know the strategy, only one in eight of those people know what to do, which is horrific. It's just scary. That still, you know, so many don't know what to do. And one of the biggest messages when I work with a leadership team is, of course, what are the different actions that you need employees to start taking to start the, immense, the momentum, the traction of the implementation? Number five, what percentage of middle managers can list their organization's top three strategies? 18, 28, or 48? There we go. Okay, everyone's gone A. Well done. So I've been running now uh, for over a decade a course called Middle Managers, the linchpin of strategy implementation. And it's interesting that there's been a complete turnaround. 
about seven, eight years ago, middle managers were considered unnecessary and a lot of companies were flatlining in terms of flattening their, their hierarchy. In the last four or five years, the reverse has happened. And McKinsey brought out a book about a year, two years ago on the role, the power of middle managers. And because we're going through so much transformation, middle managers role has not only come back, but become even more important than ever before. And this comes from MIT, all the other research is my own. Uh, number six, what percentage of senior leaders can list their organization's top three strategies? Oh, that took a pause. Okay, we got mixed on this and I'm looking to the left because I have two screens. Okay. It's B. Okay. So 51% of, of leaders, you know, senior leaders, which means only half. Okay. So the challenge we have again is that even the senior leaders aren't aligned. And this is a recipe for a disaster. Number seven, what percentage of leaders are good at both crafting and implementing strategy? This came from uh, Paul Leonard, who was on our conference about three years ago. Yes, well done. Okay, so just a quick refresh. All of you got it. Okay. So, of course, this was a catalyst of why Antonio and I started the Institute. And this comes from uh, Paul at PwC. And last question, how does implementation of a digital strategy compare to previous implementations? Better, same, or poorer? See. Thanks, Roger, Anita, well done. Yes. So, because not only do you have to change the culture, you've also got to identify and implement the right technology. And doing both of those makes it even tougher. So that was a quick warm up teaser just to get you back in. Um, now for yourselves, changing your mindset is not such a big challenge, but with many of the leaders, this is our goal. We need to change and shake up their thinking. So the way we do that, okay, the mission that we have Antonio and I through the Institute and the help of many of you and, and those who have shown us become a fellow and the others, is we need to change the way leaders think about implementation so that we have an equal focus and balance. One of the key messages in the book is that to this day, leaders still focus more on strategy than the implementation. And as a result, this is why so many are failing. So our goal is for them to have an equal balance with an equal set of skills and tools, okay? So this is a video I use just to show when we talk about changing the way you're thinking, it doesn't have to be radical. Sometimes it's just about doing things a little bit different that makes a big difference. So this is a race in Italy where he goes from last to first. Or sometimes, you know, using technology in a different way can be very productive. My goodness. <laughs> or the next one is, uh, this is a team in England. Uh, they, hadn't, they hadn't scored a goal all season. And all, most of the fans have left, but those who stayed decided to help the players see where the goal was. Yeah, Everton. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>, hilarious. <laughs> and then sometimes it's just about confusing your competition. And this one's recent one. there, Robin. No, this one's an old one. This last oh, one. I thought it was a recent one. You can see by the quality of the video. It's just there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it was my delight to launch, uh, I think it was about six, seven weeks ago. Um, it was the first time I'd ever done my own book launch after nine books. 
Uh, but everything just came together. There's a new club in Singapore who are my client and they sponsored it. Uh, Piers, the CEO of the bank in Singapore, agreed to speak. Uh, my friend, Ron Kaufman, decided to uh, agree to be the MC. And the lady in the picture is the Emeritus Professor of Singapore, um, who was my professor when I did my master's 20 odd years ago at uh, the university. And she moderated the session. So lovely uh, to kick it off with them. Uh, uh, we don't need to, don't bother about the QR code. I don't know how many people will be on today's call, but we can just keep it simple. So does strategy implementation fail because of the strategy or the implementation? The implementation. Implementation. But many you know. people think it's the strategy and they go and have another two day strategy workshop away day. But for those of you who are, are working with clients and, and you know teaching the subject, this is a great opening question. It, and I'll just step back, you know, it's a very good, it's a very powerful one to discuss with leaders to set up that it's both and, and they need that equal focus and to support their people in both areas. So it's a very, you know, I use this a lot as an opening question. It gets people focused and moving forward on it. I like I like your statement in your book, Robin, where you where you in the beginning say, you know, better better uh, have a um, strategy. Uh, what is it? Poorly implemented. Of no, yeah. better have a strategy completely good implemented, but it, I'll figure out that the strategy was poor than having a poor strategy. Uh, fantastic. Like, hang on until I'm getting it. there. That's coming up. Stop oh, giving me the crime jewels. I. <laughs> I only paid you for the nice comments, not for giving away the. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, the mission Antonio and I have is that it needs to be an equal balance, and it's still not, as Antonio is saying. It is. We need. To, we all know. You know, all of us live that passion, which is you know why we're all here. To and this is what we want to see happen. So another quiz question, true or false? Customers don't notice your strategy. True. What do they notice? The implementation. The implementation. So this is one of my most quoted, you know, when people talk about the work I do, this is what they quote the most on. And this is what I shout from the rooftops. Yeah, you know, it's been said over and over, but it doesn't matter how good your strategy is, if customers don't notice the difference. And I'm not going to do this, but it's good to ask why implementation fails. And the point from here is leaders know, they know the reasons, and this is the opening quote of the book, but knowing what to do and doing it are two different things. So leaders know it fails and they'll tell me, Poor communication, poor measurement, no alignment, no understanding what to do different, no clear clarification of what the objectives are, poor leadership, and yet it still keeps failing. Harvard uh, HBR published earlier this month, uh, sorry, earlier this year, strategy execution dwells on the implementation phase of most corporate goals, though only a paltry 10% are able to succeed at it. The remain, I love this. The remaining 90% often languish between uncertainty and failure due to avoidable mistakes. Very nicely put. Okay. So key takeaway from uh, today, key message. This is the first part of the whole book. I broke it into two parts. And the first part, I focused on this message. Organizations are missing the implementation mindset. If you get a phone call from the CEO that says, I'd like you to be part of our strategy development team. You're like, yay, you're excited. You go back and tell your partner, it's great. I'm being invited by the CEO. <sighs> Six months later, you get a phone call. We'd like you to now be part of the implementation team. Huh? What did I do wrong? Why am I being punished? I mean, I exaggerate, but that's the mindset we're competing against. Strategy is seen as the, wow, the proud, the honor. Implementation is almost seen as a punishment. 
So in the book, in the first part, I share there are three components. Leaders today need to develop the discipline, the passion, and the tenacity. So let me introduce these three. First of all, the missing discipline. Now, humans don't have the discipline, never mind as leaders, but it's not uh, built into our DNA. It's not natural. So as an example, what percentage of doctors do you think smoke? Now, these are the people who tell us every day that you have to stop smoking because it's not good for you. Or the first question they ask you if they don't know you, or one of the first is, do you smoke? So what percentage of doctors smoke? Any guesses? 70, 70, maybe a bit too high, but I think a lot. I was not quite as high as 70, fortunately. <laughs> it's 20%, just under oh. 20%. Okay. But that's one in five people who know about the damage and what it does to you. Knowing what to do and doing it are two different things. Here's another horrific one that's in the book. 90% of people, patients, after having potential life-saving surgery within 24 months are back to living the same lifestyle that Ed got them onto the, the bypass table from John Hopkins University. It's scary. People do not have the discipline. And uh, the LA Times, another one from the book, estimate that by the end of this decade, 50% of Americans will not just be overweight, but will be obese. We all know eating healthy, exercising is good, but it takes discipline to make it happen. Uh, Marshall, um, who's you know the number one coach in the world, uh, does wonderful work, lovely gentleman. Marshall was kind enough uh, also to endorse the book. Um, he says it very astutely. Just because people understand what to do doesn't ensure that they actually do it. True, isn't it? Uh, Warren Buffett, we don't have to be, I like this, we don't have to be smarter than the rest. We have to become more disciplined than the rest. So the challenge we have is that leaders habitually repeat past mistakes. They know what to do, but they don't do it. So let me take you to the second part of the in the, the discipline, which is the passion and the tenacity as well. Implementation, you've got to be as passionate about implementing as you are about crafting, and you've got to have the tenacity to stay the course. So, Atone, you'll have read this because it's the first story in the book. Uh, every chapter starts with a story. So I wanted to make it, you know, as fun to read. Uh, Antonio, thanks for saying that. As is as much, um, you know, got a lot of content, which I'll come to in a few minutes. So uh, this is a story that I use quite a bit just to help about passion and tenacity. Story comes from Egypt. And it's about a father who's lying on his deathbed. And his three sons gather around. And almost with his last few breaths, the father says to the eldest son, I want you to take half of all my camels. Now in Egypt, camels are like Mercedes or Rolls Royces or Ferraris, you know, they're priceless. To the middle son, the father says, I want you to take one third of all my camels. And to the youngest son, he says, I want you to take one ninth of all my camels. And he passes. After the sons give their respect, they later go out and they count the camels that their father left them. This is their inheritance. 17. And what? 17 camels? The eldest son, how can I take half? The middle son, how can I take a third of 17? The younger son, how can I take a nine? They ponder and ponder on the problem and they can't solve it. So they go to the village where there's a wise woman. And they tell her that their father's last wish, they want to respect it. 
but they left 17 camels. And how can I, the eldest, take half, the middle take a third, and the youngest take a ninth? And the wise woman thinks about the challenge, thinks about the problem. She reflects, and there's a silence. Then eventually she says to the three sons, I have no solution for you. All I can do is give you one of my camels. So now they have 18. The oldest son takes half, which is nine. nine. Okay, just testing. The middle son takes a third of 18, which is six. six. And the younger son takes a nine, which two. is two. Which adds up to nine plus six plus two 17. is 17. They have one camel left over that they give back to the old to the wise lady. So what's the moral of the story? Oh, deadly silence there. <laughs> Creative problem solving? There's always a solution? Working together. Okay, well, that's that. always a good answer, Sean, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chris, what do you think? So, the moral of the story is that in implementation, if it was easy, two thirds would not fail. It takes passion tenacity and discipline to be able to implement successfully. For the three sons, the solution only came after they pondered, they worked on it, and they finally got there. And this is a challenge in implementation. Nobody knows the road ahead. We can predict, we can analyze, but it's only when we start doing it, roll up our sleeves with passion and tenacity do we start to deliver. Now, this one, I, I, I would just very quickly. So, you know, we've seen over the last 20 years that implementation was improving until the pandemic when more and more people got involved in digital. And as many of you know, for the first time in 20 years, implementation is getting tougher. Why? Because in a digital world, not only do you have to implement your strategy as we've always done, but now you've got to implement the new technologies to support what you want to achieve. And as you try and do those simultaneously, it's even tougher. And this is why you need more discipline, passion, and tenacity to make it happen. So inside SII and in the book, our passion and our tenacity is to move people away from just crafting strategy, help them understand what it takes to implement the right actions. Now, most of the information, as many of you know out there today, focuses on a knowledge gap. If you search other articles outside of SII, most people just tell you why implementation fails, what you should think about. What it doesn't give you is the tools, the tips, and the techniques. So. Both, you know, Antonio and I have been passionate about sharing the how you close the action gap. So it's a two bridge challenge. First, we have to get leaders to understand why implementation needs to be seen as an equal to strategy, but then we need those tools to support. We have a plethora of tools for crafting strategy and frameworks, but very few an implementation. And this is how you deliver performance. And in the book, I use, I coined the term, the implementation knowing action gap. And this is what the book aims to close along with the release of Playbook 2.0. So this is what drives the work that we're doing. Is that okay? I'll just pause for a moment. Oh, sorry, Antonio's just come in. Let me... Okay. How are we doing? Good afternoon, Antonio. Hello, Robin. 
Hey, Hello. do you want to take a second say hi to everyone? Hi, sorry, nice to see you all. Thank you for letting me in, Robin. Sorry for being a bit late. No, no, you, you, um, I'd already told them you were going to be delayed. Great, good to see everyone. Okay. Please go, go forward. Will do. All right. So the next, the first key message in the book is that leaders are lacking the discipline, the tenacity, and the passion, which is very much the first section. The second part of the book, and it's literally broken into part one and part two, is that organizations are missing the ability to take the right actions. Now, the emphasis is on taking the right actions. So taking is that discipline that I just talked about. The right actions is we're all busy every day, but taking the right actions is knowing what to do and then doing it. And as we saw from the quiz, most people don't even know what the right actions are. So one of the main focuses when you, you know, for those of you who know on the course and in the, in the book is to clearly articulate what are the right actions across the organization to implement the strategy. Um, now, I can't remember how many of you know this. So if you know, just don't shout it out straight away. Let the others think about it. So I use this to reinforce the importance of taking the right action. Five birds sit on a fence. Three decide to leave. How many birds are left on the fence? Come on, you're looking very deep in thought there. It's not that cheap. <laughs> it's two. <laughs> so, I would say five. I would say five because they can't agree on flying away. Yeah. So just thinking, it's not doing. It's five. Anita, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know the joke, but I think it, it is it because it, uh, people tend to talk, but they never uh, move forward into acting. Oh, yeah. the decisions, there's no action. Yes. Five birds sit on a fence, three decide to leave. How many birds are left? Five. They read a wonderful new book about why they should move to the other side of the fence. They even had a conference call on the first Monday of every month discussing what to do to get to the other side of the fence, but they didn't take the right actions. So... When we focus you know, with leaders, it's about getting them to understand they've got to set up their employees and motivate and inspire them to guide them, not to um, help them, but guide them through. Yeah, okay. Oh. Asil, I'm just going to mute you. Thank you. There we go. Welcome, Asil. All right. So... Here's another one, just a fun one uh, to demonstrate the second part of the book. Can you please raise a finger, preferably not the middle one, and just draw a circle with your preferred finger? Okay, easy to do. Now put your hand down with your other hand, raise a finger. This time draw a square. Now, easy to do, yeah? Okay, now this time, with your both hands, the preferred hand, draw your circle, and with the other hand, draw the square simultaneously at the same time. <laughs> Shona, you're doing good conducting the choir there. <laughs> Codet, no, okay. So what does that represent? The circle is easy. It's what we do every day. We're a routine. We're like the, the rat you know, on the treadmill. We're just running around, running around, running around every day. The square is suddenly doing things different. The square peg and the round hole, we're struggling to make it happen. The square represents the new actions. We're asking people to do things differently while at the same time still running around. Because we all know implementation, we don't stop one day and then the next morning start differently. There can be an overlap for six, 12, 18, 24, 36 months before we become the new way of doing things. So the circle represents employees every day running around. Now you're asking them to work differently. And you struggle just to do it with a thing. Think how employees feel trying to understand what to do, why they should do it, what are the right actions. Okay. 
So that's the leader's role in helping them transform from the circle to the square. Uh, just to, for those, um, it comes um, from neuroscience. The, the cortex can't cope with the circle and the square. That's why you struggle. But it's a lovely example just to set up the challenge. So in the book, I share with the formula for success. And, and of course, Antonio, uh, you had no choice, did you? I, you had to give me an endorsement. So thank you, Antonio, as well for the endorsement. Okay. Um, so in the book, in part two, I re very much focus on the formula for success. It's small right actions by lots of people equals big change. So it's not about, you saw in the video earlier, okay, it's about doing little things like the cyclist, doing things a little bit different that makes a big impact. So if you can get every employee, 10, 20, 50,000, just doing a little bit different, that will equal big change. Okay. So it's focusing on the very important small changes. So, and Tom was setting this up, uh, thank you for it. And some of you have seen this maybe before in, in one of my other books. Is it better in a company to have A, a good strategy implemented badly, or B, a bad strategy implemented well? Oh, Anita, that was very fast. Okay, so can you just put it in the chat box? We won't do it as a discussion today. We'll just keep everyone together. Thank you, Chris. There we go, Shona. Shona, you're actually in Bali today? Oh, I just came back. I was there five days ago. Oh, I was here then too. Oh, Shona. <laughs> I wish I'd known. I'm here, for, here for a while. I was in Nisadur. All right, at, I was in at a conference. Okay, here we go. Everyone's going B. Okay. All right. Now, this again is a wonderful question. And I I've used this for many years with leaders. And in the book, I share that 80% of leaders, and I've interviewed over 5,000 leaders, 80% answer A. They argue that having a good strategy will give you the foundation will give you, um, will set you off in the right direction. And if you're making things, if things aren't working, you'll fix it along the way. Those are the three most common arguments I hear for A. But it doesn't work. And we all know it because you've all answered B. First of all, how do you know if a strategy is good? Only when you Did it. implement it. Okay. So... You, everyone walks out thinking they have a good strategy. Nobody goes into the boardroom. Okay, guys, we're going to create a bad strategy today. Everyone thinks they have a good strategy, but you don't know until you implement it. So why is B the right answer? Because implementation, good implementation, is about having inside the structure, the systems, the processes, the measurement, all the things that we cover in SIR, the strategy implementation roadmap. And when you've got that capability, and here's the key factor, you know when your implementation is not working. Now you might go, huh? That's it, Robin? But yes. What Antonio and I see when we work with our different clients and we say, how is your implementation going? I go, well, I don't really know. I think it's going okay. But they can't show us the hard data and information. But when you're good at implementation, you track the progress. You know when things are not working. And then you either go back upstream and you make a big change or sometimes just a tweak. But the important thing is you know. And also in the implementation, you're taking the right actions. So you get there in the end. Okay. 
Uh, and in addition, because today we are living in a very uh, fast changing times, um, a, a perfect strategy, which you mean is really suitable, might be not that perfect anymore in, in half a year. So you also need the measures in place to adjust your uh, strategy according to the changing environment. So this is also the structures you, you told about. You really need to. But as I said, there's no such thing as a perfect strategy. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you walk out the boardroom, it changes. But yes, if you have the measures, you know how to adjust it. Fully agree. Well said. Uh, so just one of the examples I use in the book, I've got various use cases um, from all over the world. Uh, this is one I use to support this. Of course, our goal in the Institute is to set in SII is to set people up with a winning strategy and a successful implementation. And I often use the example of IKEA. What's IKEA's business model? What do they offer? Fashionable furniture for people with not a lot of money and uh, can be used in a very creative way. Okay, good, sure. nicely put, with not a lot of money. So we'll put it even more politely. Value for money, that'd be okay? <laughs> so their strategy was created 60 odd years ago when they were loading tables to deliver them in Sweden on a truck. And the, the one guy came up with the idea. He said, well, if we don't add the legs, we can stack more tables and do more deliveries instead of one or two tables at a time. That was the birth of the IKEA strategy that's hardly changed in 60 odd years. So why, you know, who competes against, with, uh, against IKEA globally? They have no global competitor in terms of stores. Why are they so successful? Because not only do they have a great strategy, but they're phenomenal at their implementation. So a very quick example. A few years ago, they opened up in India. And India is not a DIY, which is do it yourself. It's a DIFM culture. Do you know DIFM? It's do it for me. Mm -hmm. So Indians don't spend their weekends fixing the lights or the drains or pro they like just getting handymen in. So this was critical. When you check out IKEA in India, there's a little sign and you can scan the QR code and it will give you an option of handymen who will come to your home and build your furniture. Now they under they, they achieved that because they really understood their customer. Okay. So they're good at both. Uh, I was doing one session and I said to her in the room, what do you think of when you think of IKEA? She said meatballs. <laughs> or have you seen this one? <laughs> All right. So uh, towards the tail end, uh, we're bang on time. Um, in the second part of the book, my main focus, uh, as Antonio and I do with the Institute and the, the CBOC 2.0 and with Implement, and Antonio, I don't know if you want to tease with your new book coming out next year. Um, our focus is to set leaders up with more skills, capabilities, frameworks, techniques, and tools. And Tony and I share this passion. Okay. So one of the tools you find in the book is the subtitle of the book is Doing It Right in a Digital World. So this is a framework, an, an award-winning framework that I developed uh, five years ago that has been used by different companies and governments around the world, which is guiding them from being traditional to digital. That highlights the inner side is the three strategic steps and the outer is the 11 operational steps. Okay, and we call it the ticking clock. While we, over the last five years in the work I've been doing in this space, we found that the biggest challenge was actually step number one, which was establishing your digital ambition. And step number two, which is the predominant reason why transformation fails, or one of the top three reasons, is senior leader mindset. Uh, very quickly, the other two are culture lagging behind digital transformation changes, and also um, not transforming the whole company, only parts of it. So earlier this year, 
we launched a new model called the IDCLA, which put the focus on helping leaders achieve their future thinking. And this is also in the book. And this is, you know, amazingly, we've been, I ran this uh, with Microsoft, with Siemens, we, we've been running it, um, you know, in, in, in Europe, in America, it's been very well received. So I'm just very quickly going to take you around Brian, oh, sorry, um, Brian did, sorry. Um, okay, so the goal is to move from digital detachment to digital determination. So in our research that um, I published um, in February, we identified that there was a difference between the way leaders at the top were seeing digital transformation to the rest of the organization. And uh, true or false, you know, uh, where's it gone? So without a digital ambition, you're just running around doing multiple projects. The ambition aligns you so that everybody understands why we're doing it and it sustains your transformation. So here we go. The first step is identifying what does digital mean to your customers? Now that's a very critical first question. Many companies who fail Start by asking, what does digital mean to our business? But that's an inside out. When you start with the customer, this is what top performing companies and leaders do. So you do your research, much like design thinking in your empathy stage. You identify what needs to happen. What, are, what will digital do for them? What do they want? Then you decide your focus, which is the D. Are we going to be efficient? Are we going to focus on the customer or both? Are we going to develop new ecosystems, new connections? So then you decide what is the right positioning for your customer. Then you start to cultivate the transformation culture, transformative culture. Culture lags behind transformation. It's as I just briefly said earlier, it's one of the top three reasons why transformation fails. So you've got to make sure the culture is changing. You can't expect people to work different if you don't change the culture. Four is how are you going to use data? Two key messages here. First, there are two types of companies. Those who are data driven and those that don't exist. You have to be data-driven, otherwise you'll be out of business. Secondly, the better the data, the better the decisions, the better the performance. So you've got to transform to a data-driven mindset. And number five, you've got to activate, from, move from awareness to action, which we've already talked about. So the IDCLA has to guide people. And the last model I'm going to, show, well, second last model, in the second part of the book, it's structured around the eight areas. Um, when Antonio and I, Antonio, we were discussing uh, developing, we decided to create our own model for the Institute, but this one, I've, it's similar to what we do. So I'll just use Sir as the example. So the framework you just saw, I call the implementation compass. It was some of the thinking that helped Antonio and I develop SIR. You all know SIR, but they're very similar. They overlap quite heavily. What's important? What's the key takeaway? Leaders need a framework to guide them through the implementation the same way they need a framework to help them craft the strategy. So some closing thoughts. We need leaders to fall in love with both the strategy and the implementation. Digital transformation is failing, not because of technology, but because of the challenge of changing the company. Knowledge is not a differentiator today. Everyone can get knowledge. It's what you do with the knowledge that matters. As we discussed earlier, strategy includes implementing well and leaders can shape the choices by leveraging AI to create something called digital nudges that lead to better choices. So in the book, I share a tool that we launched this year, which is using AI to fuel 
the last mile of strategy implementation, which is something called digital nudges. There we go. Now I've got a couple of fun slides just to share at the end, but let me pause. We've got a few minutes left. Comments, reactions, what comments or reactions do you have? Um, I found a question, if I may. Um, I know uh, like uh, 2019, you have done a very comprehensive study across North America, Europe and Asia, where you came up with the compass. Did you now repeat this study in order to have a benchmark comparison and to see if, for example, in Asia things are improving, old Europe is still lagging behind? Um, are there any trends you can say what has changed after the six or five years? Uh, you're spot on, Anita. Yes, we did. So it wasn't um, in that research you're referring to was the earlier model, the ticking clock. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do as soon as we finish this presentation, I'll send you the second paper, which we published in ah. February this year, which was our before and after pandemic research. And this mm -hmm. one went even further. It went to four continents and um, over 2,300 leaders. So mm -hmm. I'll share that white paper with you as soon as we, we finish the call. That be okay? Great. Thanks. And Claudia, please. Great presentation. Can't wait to read the book. Speaks to everything that excites me. So much to say, but we only got a minute. So um, I wondered, have you ever thought about what behaviors um, motivate and, and or do not motivate people to implement? Like, is that because when I think of the other examples that you were using, why people don't change, it's because they have developed certain behaviors that are, there's a reward system and a whole psychological mentality attached to those. And I wondered whether, you know, um, there is a connection here or can it be going here? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'll use sir because we're all familiar with sir. Uh, whether you sir or, you know, my, my, my own company's um, compass, it doesn't matter. Claudia, the answer to your question is it has to be multiple factors. There's no single answer. They've got to see it from their peers changing. They've got to have the support from their leaders. You've got to change their measurement. You've got to change your reinforcement. So it's going through the seven critical areas on SIR and them all coming and applying different forces that inspire and encourage people to change their behaviors. Okay. I'm going to keep it short so we finish on time. And I want to give... Uh, Roger, you were first, and then we'll go Chris, and then Anita. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I will keep it brief. One of the big things that we find helps our clients in shaping their strategy is actually to, as you, to your point about culture, you know, culture can, I know what's always been said about culture eating strategy for breakfast, but how culture can get in the way, uh, is actually to generate data on their culture. So understanding what their culture is made of, understanding where the hidden energy is in terms of Love it. driving the change, but also what, what is blocking the change. And that then should help inform the strategy, certainly from the organizational point of view. Anyway. Yeah. So if I, if I paraphrase what you're saying, and I absolutely agree, Roger. Um, people say they want to change the culture, but they don't have a baseline. They don't have the current understanding of what they're changing from to. So there's no as is and should be. Absolutely right. agree. Thank you. Chris? Hey there. Uh, yeah, great presentation. Thanks. I look forward to reading the book. Uh, I think I think Roger said most of what I was going to say. So uh, I won't waste any more time on that. All right. No, I appreciate that, Chris. That will give us a chance for Anita to come back in. Um, yeah, yes, I, I think uh, one thing that really troubles me here in Europe is uh, the awareness of companies that they need to change in any way, like a digital transformation or transformation. I don't see it. I don't see it in the job market. And I'm really very concerned. And the next thing is also here the mentality, maybe in Europe, maybe I'm biased, is a lot of managers now they need to do a work. Usually they just sit there, tell people what to do, but now they need to engage. They need to go down, meet people <laughs> on eye level. I'm not sure because this is what really I, I feel and I have the trouble with is um, I think this is I think the biggest step because it's not the we and the day the employees and I think here people still are treated not the way not the respect and and so on and not their value and but they need to recognize that the people are the biggest asset I think this is the biggest obstacle here at least in the uh, CE region. 
So, Anita, um, I focus predominantly in the Middle East and um, Asia, and Antonio represents Europe and America. So I'm going to let Antonio answer that question. But what, how does he see leaders in Europe? Well, I think often it's going to the, lead, the CEO, and if you manage to convince the CEO, then everything goes smoother. Um, it's always still very hierarchical here. So um, it's the, yeah, once you get the eye and the ears from that person, then it's just much easier to, <clears throat> to convince them of what Robin is saying or strategy implementation. And, but it's a, it's a hard sell. It's just very difficult. And I'll, I'll add one more thing to Antonio said that when Antonio and I, we work with a company, if they won't give us access to the CEO, then we don't do the work. Because if the CEO is not on board, you, you're just going to get so frustrated. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I got 30 seconds. I'm going to finish it off um, with some fun. Um, uh, Shona, this is just for you. Uh, implementation never goes according to plan. How's your How's your old Scottish? Okay. Yep. Uh, the best. So the best, the best lip. Oh, do you want to go? Go on. No, no, you carry on. Carry on. I thought you were just. No, I misunderstood. Go no, on. no, please do. The best lead schemes are mice and men gang after glee. There we go. It's an old Scottish, which you all know the meaning of. The best laid plans of mice and men never go according to plan. Uh, this was our re our only famous Scottish poet, Robert Burns. So just some fun slides to end. <laughs> this is a oh. pencil used by school kids. So what happens is they keep sharpening the pencil. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do drugs, it becomes. Uh, this was a and in the 80s. Implementation never goes according to plan. They were competing against uh, McDonald's successful quarter pounder. So they released the third pounder. The only problem, Americans thought a quarter was bigger than a third. <laughs> uh, these don't need any explanation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still cracked. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. <laughs> this is true. This was actually designed in mm. Russia for Sochi. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I think it's the yeah, last one. <laughs> That's not me scuba diving, fortunately. All right. Um, so one small favor, um, those who've got the book or getting the book, um, you know, please do lead a, an Amazon review as a thank you for today. That's my only request. Um, thank you to everyone. We, we're up on time, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, Antonio, are you, I don't know if he's still with us or he had to go. Um, the next meeting is uh, potentially November the 5th is what we're targeting. Uh, Anita, I hope to see you in, in Vienna. Uh, we're there the 14th and 15th, I think it is, for the Drucker Forum. Okay. All right. So as you know, we start and finish on time. So my apologies. I'm just a couple of minutes over. Thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today. And we'll see you in four weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Antonio, I didn't see you. Sorry that you were below. Anything it's to okay. say? Okay, no, thank you, Robin. See you next time. Apologies, Cheers. Antonio. Take care, everyone. Any oh.